This is genetics, not a problem, and today's not a problem is dihybrid crosses. Uh, in pea plants, let's say that tall is dominant to short and purple flowers are dominant to white. Um, and from a cross between a uh, tall and purple doubly heterozygous plant, so when you see that, um, let's write heterozygous for the tall and heterozygous for the purple. Um, and you're going to cross that to homozygous tall. So you're going to go the two big T's um, and white. Okay, so we know white has to be two little P's because we've already been told that, that white is recessive. All right, we're going to do that cross between these two uh, independently sorting genes. Um, though it didn't say in the question, but if I had written it correctly, I would have said these are independently assorting genes. Um, what fraction of the progeny will be tall? So that means T something and white will be um, little p, little p. So uh, let's just treat this like two monohybrids and then apply the product rule to put them together. So let's look at the tall first. Um, what fraction will be tall? Well, pretty much all of them because um, every, every offspring is going to get at least one big T. So um, we're going to say that this is, this is basically one or, or 100%. Um, and then what fraction are going to be uh, little p, little p? Well, you're going to get a, definitely get a little p from uh, this parent, and then half of the uh, progeny will also get a little p from, from the other parent. So it's going to be 50% that are going to have um, this genotype here, 0.5. Um, and so using your product rule, it's just 1 by 0.5, and so the answer is going to be a half. Now let's say in the, in the same pea plants, tall again is dominant to short, and purple flowers are dominant to white. Um, these genes are on different chromosomes, meaning they're independently assorting. Uh, if a, a homozygous tall white plant, so homozygous tall, do, 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 and homozygous white, um, is mated to a short homozygous purple plant. So short is recessive, so they're going to have the two little t's. Um, and we're told it's homozygous purple, so we'll put the big p's there. Um, and then we're going to intercross the F1. Okay, so let's Let's make our F1, which you can hopefully see just from looking at that, they're going to be all doubly heterozygous. And if we're going to intercross them, we're going to set up this type of cross here. Um, and then I think um, well, you guys should know that from this, you're going to get a, like a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 of uh, phenotypic ratios. Um, but then what they're asking you here is what fraction of the offspring are expected to look like one of the original parents, that is, um, one of the parents that was either uh, tall and white. So who's going to look tall and white? Um, and and um, who is going to look um, short and purple? Tall and white or short and purple? So um, what we're probably going to do here is um, just figure out the probability of tall white, and then we're going to add that right to the probability of, of short and purple. Um, so let's just let's do tall white first, um, and so what what fraction um, of these guys are going to be uh, tall and white? Well, um, let's let's write out the genotypes that are associated with that nine to three to three to one. So hopefully you know that this is going to be your nine, um, and then this is going to be three, and then little t little t big p something is going to be three. And then your double homozygous recessive is going to be one. So, so what are these guys going to look like? This group right here, this group right here is going to look tall and white. Okay, so that's going to be three out of sixteen. Um, who's going to look short and purple? It's going to be these guys right here. These guys are going to look short and purple. So that's going to be three out of sixteen. Um, and so your total. Um, if we add those together using using our sum rule, we can get 6 out of um, 16, and another way of saying that is 3 out of 8, and that should be the answer. Let's do another one with pea plants. So in this problem, again, tall is dominant to short, purple is dominant to white. These are independently assorting genes. Um, so what we're going to do in this one is we're going to do some of these things called test crosses, um, what they said is that tall purple plant one is test cross. So whenever you see that, um, you know that you're trying to determine the genotype of an unknown. And the reason that it's unknown is because it has the dominant phenotype. So 
That means if it's tall, it's got a big T, but you don't really know what else it has. It could have a big T or a little T. Um, and if it's purple, again, all you really know is that it has at least one of those dominant alleles. So we're going to take plant number one, and we're going to test cross it. Now, whenever you do a test cross, you're using um, an animal that's going to help reveal the genotype. And the best way to do that is to take the recessive homozygote. Um, and if you're doing this in the context of a dihybrid, they're going to be um, a double uh, homozygous recessive. Um, and so basically then, um, let's, let's take a look at what happens. Um, the progeny of this first test cross are all tall, and half of them are purple. So the beautiful thing about the, the test cross is it pretty much directly tells you what's in these blanks. So if, if all the progeny are tall, all tall, then that means there had to be a big T there. Okay. And if, if only half of them are purple, that means there had to be a little P right there. Okay, so um, half, half purple. All right, so that's, that's individual one from a test cross. Let's check out uh, another one. Let's do individual two. Okay, um, this one is test crossed, and the offspring fall into four phenotypic categories. Okay, so what, is, so what does that mean? <laughs> so, so we took, a, we took a, an unknown individual that was tall and purple. We didn't know what else they had in there. And then we're going to put our test cross individual next to that. And, and we're going to cross them. And then what we're going to get out is one to one to one to one. Um, we, we saw four categories. And so this is, this is really nice because it tells you if, if there was four different things observed, then there had to be four different alleles here. So meaning there had to be a small and there had to be a small. Okay, so that way you could get out um, an individual that got got the, the big the big T and the big P went there. Maybe the big T and the little P went, went to this one. And then maybe the, the, the little T and the big P went there. And then the little t and the little p went there. So there was, there's four different combinations that you can get when you have a double heterozygote. And so whenever you see that nice one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one from a test cross, um, that, that tells you um, that that was a double heterozygote. All right, here's uh, another way to sort of assess whether you understand uh, independent assortment. Um, and that's the question, um, how many genetically different types of gametes can be produced from an individual of this genotype? Okay, so this looks pretty complex, but it's not really. Um, so, so we ask you, okay, provided these are independently assorting genes, meaning each, each of these events is independent of the other, um, how, many, how many different types of gametes can you make? Um, and this is pretty, pretty simple, because for, for, every, for every gene at which uh, this organism is heterozygous, there's, there's really two ways that these um, homologs can line up on the metaphase plate with respect to each other. And so um, right in here, you can see that this, this gene isn't heterozygous, so we're just going to drop that out of the equation because that's not going to create any sort of genetically uh, different gamete no matter how it lines up. So what we've got, we've got one, two, three, four genes that are heterozygous. And when you see something like that, the number of possibilities is two to the n. And here, n n equals 4. So 2 to the 4 is, is 16. And, and if you're not quite sure why that is, you can sort of um, break it down into maybe uh, a couple of genes. And you can ask, OK, say I had uh, two sets of chromosomes, and they were both, um, you know, they were both representing heterozygous uh, conditions. You could see how the chromosomes could line up in two different ways with respect to each other, OK? Um, and even you can even sort of figure this out with two to the one, right? If you had, if you had uh, two different alleles on your chromosomes, maybe an A and an A, draw little chromosomes there, <laughs> then you, you know that you can make two different types of gametes, right? You can make an A or an A, right? So that's just with one, and two to the one is two. Um, and then you can just repeat that with, with all the other ones, and you can find out that, that the two to the N really does make sense for that type of analysis. Um, and lastly, um, how many genetically different types of gametes can be produced by an individual with a diploid number of six chromosomes? So this is very similar to the last one, except now um, instead of giving you a genotype, we're just giving you the number of chromosomes. So whenever you see this uh, diploid number, you should write two to the two uh, n equals six. Okay, so the haploid number haploid number is uh, three. Okay, uh, so 
this is the n that you want to use when you do that two to the n uh, analysis like we did with the last question. So if you want to know how many different types of gametes you can make um, and your haploid number of chromosomes is, is three, then it's going to be two to the three or eight. Okay. Um, and again, remember, remember that this is the number that you want to use and not the full diploid number. Um, because, so let's think back to the last one that we were doing. We had something like that, A, A, B, B, C, C, and let's say each of these represented maybe a different chromosome. Um, when we did, when we said two to the N, we were talking about the number of genes, right? Not, not really the number of alleles. So, um, so yeah, just keep that in mind when you see, uh, the diploid number, just write that down, get down to your N, and then that's the, that's the number that you're going to work with when determining the number of types of, of gametes that you can get out.